Okay, as promised, part two of the lecture on uh, classification. This is Professor Schimmeld. Okay, we're going to pick it up with, um, I want to talk next about uh, the uh, classification specifically of the bacteria. This is Roman numeral two in your outline. And I'm going to talk about um, a number of criteria that can be used to make classification decisions for prokaryotic organisms. Uh, some are what I refer to as being classic techniques, and then uh, and I'll talk about some of those, and then I will talk about some of the modern techniques as well. All right, so let's pick it up with um, an introduction to why do we still use some of the classic techniques. I mean things like gram staining, morphology, arrangement of cells, um, metabolism of certain nutrients like... Um, uh, carbohydrates, etc., because it works to make identifications in the laboratory. All right, so that's why we still talk about these criteria, even though we have some modern technologies that provide us um, much more useful information about the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. But in the clinical laboratory, these classic techniques still work. All right, so um, first on the list would be. Um, uh, for making classification decisions would be the microscopic morphology of the bacterium. Here's what I mean. Are they um, coxide bacilli spirilla or something else? So that would be um, uh, the morphology of the cells. Uh, it would also include, microscopic morphology would also include the arrangement of the cells. We've talked about that. Uh, we would also look at the structural characteristics of the cells. I mean things like uh, does the cell produce endospores or capsules? And finally, in this category, microscopic morphology, we would look at the staining characteristics of the cells, gram-positive, gram-negative, acid-fast, non-acid-fast. Okay, so let's move on to uh, second of the classic criteria would be the growth characteristics of the colonies. So what do the colonies look like when they're grown on um, solid microbiological media. I already talked about this. Staph aureus, grown on triptych soy auger, white colonies, grown on blood auger, pale yellow colonies. All right, so that's part of this uh, growth characteristics of colonies. So I would, uh, we would include uh, the production of um, any pigments, for example, for growth characteristics of colonies. We would look at the texture of the colonies. I mean, are they um, smooth and moist? Are they dry, wrinkled, rough? etc. Um, their size and their shape, all right, are they tiny little pinpoint colonies like a bacterium named Mycoplasma pneumoniae produces, um, or are they um, um, large with um, very smooth um, um, edges? And I think I covered everything there, and you've got a, um, a pretty cool photo in your notes. It's just a bunch of um, uh, pigmented bacteria growing on triptych soy auger, just kind of a fun picture. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm turning pages here. All right, so next, when we're talking still classic um, uh, criteria for um, making taxonomy decisions for bacteria, next on my list would be physiology. And here are some of the things that we would include in this category. First of all, what is the preferred temperature for optimum growth? Okay, now most of the bacteria that we will study this semester are either human pathogens or human normal flora, and they prefer human body temperature, but there are bacteria that have evolved to live in pretty much any environment that you could imagine. So uh, we would want to know, one of the questions we would ask would be, what is the preferred temperature for optimum growth? Uh, we would also want to know something about the bacterium's relationship to oxygen. I mean, is it an aerobe, an anaerobe, a facultative anaerobe, or there are some other possibilities. Uh, we would want to know its pH range tolerance. Now, less diversity here with the bacteria than with maybe some other criteria. Most bacteria want the pH to be pretty close to neutral, but there are exceptions. Some require more acidic and, some re and others require more alkaline environments. Uh, okay, let's move on to nutritional requirements, another of the classic criteria. And we can be really simple here. Um, I'm talking about what nutrients can the microorganism metabolize and what metabolic waste products does it produce. 
And um, you've got a picture of an entero tube there. If you asked me uh, when we're together in class, I can show you one of those and explain how it works. But it's essentially a plastic tube with many different kinds of microbiological media in it, uh, testing the ability to metabolize different substances. And um, it gets inoculated by pulling a, um, um, a sterile piece of metal through the, um, uh, through the tube to inoculate all of those at the same time. But we can take a look at one. All right, so that brings us to modern criteria for the classification of bacteria. First of all, uh, we're learning way lots of information about the genetic uh, uh, characteristics of bacteria and other organisms, number of technologies that can be used. I'm just going to briefly mention them. Uh, one would be um, what we call generally DNA homology studies. Um, homo means the same, all right? So, um, uh, let's see what have I got in your notes. Uh, DNA homology examinations, that would involve, and I'm really boiling this down, you guys, comparing DNA samples from two organisms. So we're looking at the, um, the specific sequence of nucleotides, and the more similarities we find when we make this comparison, the more closely related they are. And uh, DNA base composition, even more specific, look at things like the, um, uh, the, the ratio of guanine to cytosine. What's interesting to me is, like, who thought of that? But, and I don't know, but it is uh, kind of an interesting approach. All right, uh, next of the modern criteria for classification, protein analysis. Very similar to what I just got done describing except this time we are going to obtain protein samples from two organisms and compare them. Same bottom line, the more similarities we find, the more closely related they are. Now, phage typing. Okay, I'm talking about um, there is a, um, there's a type of virus called um, the bacteriophage. Sometimes we just call them phages or phage. Either pronunciation is correct. And these, I'm going to say phage though, okay? Uh, these phages, um, they will be able to attach to very specific receptors on the surface of very specific bacteria and infect them. So, um, and this is how the phage is going to infect the bacterium and, and convert the bacterium into a virus factory to reproduce itself. Now, we can determine uh, the type, the strain of a bacterium by examining its susceptibility to certain bacteriophages. Let me give you an example. E. coli, okay? Many different strains of E. coli. Typically, the ones that live in our gut and they're supposed to be there, um, they're, they're beneficial to us. Really, we couldn't survive without them. But there are some strains of E. coli that produce nasty toxins. And we can uh, test, let's say we have um, uh, a cluster of food uh, poisoning cases and we know that it was E. coli, but we need to know, is it just, you know, kind of garden variety E. coli or is it one of the uh, nastier, more pathogenic strains? We can uh, determine what strain we're dealing with by using this technique called phage typing. Uh, also, we have on our list of um, modern criteria, um, serology and um, uh, as it says in your notes, when an organism like me, for example, is, in, is infected with a bacterium, uh, my body would produce antibody molecules to help to uh, attack and eliminate that invader in my body. And we can detect those antibodies and um, determine you know, first, am I infected? And secondly, who am I infected with? Okay, now um, this brings us to Roman numeral three, classification systems for bacteria. And let me talk to you about... Um, your responsibility for this section, right? As it says, uh, the classic system, that's the one used in the Burgess manual that I mentioned earlier. There is um, an addendum A, all right? Now, both 102 and 150 students are gonna be working with this document. And if you look at the uh, bacterial survey, you will see it's divided into, I think, 20 groups, maybe. Let me just refresh my memory. Papers and um, each group after the name, like number one, spirochetes, you'll see in parentheses um, um, the class uh, numbers. Sorry, I'm not doing a very good job here. For example, the spirochetes. It says both 
102 and 150 in parentheses after the name Spirokey. What that means is, is that both my 102 and my 150 students are responsible for all of the information in that section. All right, so you need to know that the spirochetes are gram negative, they use axial filaments. You need to know the examples, treponema pallidum causes syphilis, etc. So if, if it says in the addendum that you're responsible uh, for that section, that means you're responsible for all the info in that section. Now, other sections like number two, helicovibroid gram negative bacteria says, 150. So my 150 students are responsible for that. My 102 students are not. Okay, and so as you go through this document, hopefully you'll be able to see um, what you're responsible for. Ask me if you're not sure. And then I'm going to go to the very last page, which is for my 150 students, my medical micro students only. And that is a table on um, just a little bit of information, believe it or not, from the, um, the modern system of classification. And um, you guys, the medical micro students, you are responsible for this table. Intro micro students, you are not. Okay, that wraps up part two. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.